If I could uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands that we're meeting on all around uh, Victoria or well, Australia uh, today online and uh, here on the land of the Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung and Boonwurrung, Boonwurrung peoples of the Eastern Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to Elders past, present, emerging uh, and any who Elders who are here with us today and acknowledge that these lands, not any of them, were ever ceded. Huge thanks to Uniting Vic Taz for generously hosting us here in this magnificent venue at their head office today. Uh, and I won't go any further without introducing to you Christy Looney, who is the General Manager of Housing and Property for Uniting, of Uniting Vic Taz. Uh, Christy has been responsible for driving the implementation of uh, Uniting Housing's growth strategy in partnership with Uniting Vic Taz to increase the social and affordable housing supply uh, in Victoria and Tassie. So over to you, Christy. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I'll also begin by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land, uh, which we're meeting here today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, um, and extend that respect to um, Elders with us here today, and also recognise we live and we work on lands that are unceded. Um, I'd like to warmly welcome you all here. Um, I think, um, you know, um, we're so fortunate to have this building and it is a result of Wesley Place and the church and the charitable work and community services um, that have taken place on this site for the last hundred years. Uh, Uniting Vic Taz is um, so fortunate um, on a kind of ground lease arrangement to have this level of the building for free and we are wrapped when people come and use the space and bring a different energy which is otherwise very corporate um, so we're just joyed to have you here so thank you um, for joining us do we have people online today uh, and I'd like to welcome the people online as well um, who can't be here physically um, uh, but it's wonderful that you could join so we're really really excited to, and honored to be hosting the launch of the July parity um, and uh, I think um, just as Jenny said on the eve of Homelessness Week, uh, which will commence on Monday. Um, so within this parity is a very important and I think way too often hidden issue of pregnancy and homelessness. Um, so uh, we know the theme, as I'm sure we all know working in the sector, to the theme this year um, to end homelessness, we need a plan. Um, and we're going to hear from some incredible people today, panels, you know, of programs um, that are transformative. But before we kind of kicked off with that, I did want to take a few minutes to share a story. Um, and I wanted to share it because um, I wanted to talk about the importance of the programs we're going to hear about today, but particularly what happens after that, and that there is a plan for a pathway and for, um, you know, access to long term social and affordable housing as that next step and how we get there. So the story is about a young woman who did fall pregnant in high school. She was very young. She was born, uh, her son was born with a disability, and she was told that he wouldn't walk or talk. So she was young, she was single. We've all heard these stories. She was applying for rental properties and she could not. Um, she could not get a response, a look in, um, and so found herself homelessness. Um, then one day her life changed. So she was given the opportunity to rent a property through a social housing provider, you know, like Uniting Housing, like Housing First, like many of the CHPs we have here with us today. So rent was affordable and the home was long term. It meant she could now focus on the really important things in life. So finishing year 12, um, getting a university degree, being a present mum and doing all the therapy for her son to help him have the best chance in life. So she was able to get a part-time job. Um, her income changed uh, depending on, on her work and she was able to build her confidence during those years. So it was a wonderful opportunity um, to cement herself and, you know, and build her confidence and really have her life take off. So this story is a true story. It's my story. And it's why I'm here today and why I work with all of you in the sector, um, because we have an opportunity to create huge impact 
and it's what we do. I think it's what drives us every day. Um, and it's what really motivates me. So I really welcome the women that we're, we're having here today, the wonderful programs. And for me on Homelessness Week, I reflect on um, how do we ensure that there are pathways into long-term housing supply um, so that we don't see that kind of cycle of homelessness and women returning to unsafe, violent relationships. So thank you everyone. Thank you for your time. Thank you for coming. And um, I think I'm handing over to Jenny. Thank you, Jenny. <clears throat> well, thanks, Christy. And, and how lovely to um, have not uh, just a welcome from the Uniting, but a very special um, sharing from you, I think, which has uh, got us off exactly on the on the right foot. Um, so um, that was a very special surprise. Um, a great deal of work has gone into the development and preparation of this edition of Parity, and you can all see it in its glossy fineness uh, on your uh, chairs. But I want to, before we go any further, particularly thank the members of the Pregnancy and Homelessness Network, and especially uh, Teresa Lynch, its con convener, who you'll hear from later. Uh, I'd also like to thank the sponsors, because Parity wouldn't happen ever without the, uh, the sponsors. And on this occasion, special thanks to Launch Housing for being the main sponsor, because without Launch, this edition wouldn't have happened. And, and huge thanks also to the other sponsors, Safe and Equal, the Royal Women's Hospital, Housing First and uh, Task Force. And also I'd like to acknowledge our parody editor, Noel Murray, who's um, delivered yet again. But today we have with us uh, our minister, our Victorian Minister for Women, uh, Natalie Hutchins, um, recently appointed, um, but we're just delighted to have her here with us today um, to launch this edition. Minister Hutchins is also the Minister for Education in the Andrews Victorian Government, and she has been a minister of many things, um, Minister for Industrial uh, Relations, Aboriginal Affairs, Local Government, uh, prevention of family violence in the first term of the, of the current government and more recently Minister for Corrections, Crime Prevention, Youth Justice and Victim, Victim Support. And to all of those portfolios, Minister Hutchins has brought her focus on fairness and inclusiveness and uh, underpinned by her ambition for our community in Victoria to be active, diverse, resilient and proud. And I think in all of Minister Hutchins' work, we can see her commitment to everyone having equal access to a decent job, excellent education and first class health care. So Mr Hutchins, we feel incredibly privileged that you've joined us today to launch this edition. Um, over to you. Thanks, Jenny. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for having me here today and what an amazing publication. Uh, that we're coming together to launch and I've had the opportunity to read some of the stories already in there and I'm really impressed uh, with this edition. Can I begin by acknowledging uh, the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and for those online, um, your places that you come from too and the, um, the Aboriginal First Nations people that are there, um, that you, that are there on the lands that you are um, I'd also like to acknowledge victim survivors of family violence, honour those who have tragically lost their lives to family violence and acknowledge the families who continue to live with the trauma and the experience. And we know that the fallout um, of why many pregnant women end up homeless is because uh, it's quite often linked to partner violence. Um, your stories and adv advocacy really remain at the core of all of your work. And it's a privilege to join some of you um, in leading voices in gender equality. Many of you are working in women's health and housing at today's event. Thank you to the Council of Homeless People for your invitation to work together to convene, to represent and advocate for all the organisations uh, across the sector who do such crucial work, which we know ultimately saves lives. A home is much more than a place to stay. For pregnant women, new mums, safe, stable housing is a place to prepare physically, mentally, practically for the arrival of a baby. A home can provide support to new mums that is nothing short, as I said, as life-saving. 
um, my own personal story. And thank you, Christy, for, for sharing your story. Um, it, it was really um, heartfelt and um, I know really hard sometimes to talk about your own personal experiences in that context in front of everyone. Um, but certainly um, I'm the daughter of um, a, a young woman of 17 who found herself pregnant um, and uh, had me um, against the odds at the time. And we lived in high rise public housing for the first five years of my life. And um, mum decided she wanted to get out of that situation. And we moved into the private housing rental market. And by the time I was 18, we had moved house 20 times. And I know that's not an unusual story for many families, but I know what it is to pack up a house at you know five minutes to midnight and have to move. Um, because we're behind in the rent or because they gave us very short notice and, and quite often mum didn't know quite frankly what her rights were at that time. Um, she's come a long way. She now tells me how to do my job um, on a regular basis. Um, but we know that um, appropriate supports um, are really what we need, not just um, are the roofs over our heads. Um, when women find themselves in this um, experience of homelessness during pregnancy. So in recognition of this, the Victorian Labor government is proud to support the groundbreaking work of the Cornelia program, the first collaboration of its kind in Australia. I'm really proud to say that the program provides safe, secure accommodation and access to a range of specialised health and social services for pregnant women and new mums experiencing homelessness with a focus on keeping mother and baby together creating pathways to long-term housing. I really commend the program's partners, a launch housing, Housing First and the Royal Women's Hospital for their pioneering efforts in this space. Thanks um, in part to the 3.1 million Victorian government investment in this program, which is now fully funded to operate for the next five years. And wouldn't it be great if I could stand up here, you know, in the next few years and say, funded ongoing, that would be great something we're working on in the women's portfolio. <laughs> um, it's great that pregnant women and new mums can thrive in these sort of safe environments. Um, whilst there are many reasons a person may experience homelessness, as I said, many of the women that we come into contact with in these situations have experienced partner violence. I know personally during the pandemic, I decided to keep my electoral office open for the sole purpose of being able to receive um, the complaints face to face um, from women who were experiencing family violence during COVID um, and helping them to deal with, um, unfortunately, a growing cohort of families that were experiencing that in the outer west. Access to safe, secure, affordable housing is a gender equality issue. It must be a core part of our work going forward. And I've got to say, I was extremely pleased last Friday to be um, sitting around the table with the ministers for women from around the country and the ministers for women's safety and the family violence prevention space, um, along with our new ministers in the federal government and actually have a conversation that went to real feminist values, which I can't say that I, I was able to have four and five years ago when I was around the same table. Um, and the beauty of, of that meeting on Friday was to hear um, the lead minister from the federal government, the Minister for Women, who is also the Minister for Finance, articulate the connection between those two portfolios and the issues of long-term funding um, for our services. And um, it was music to my ears to hear her say that unprompted. So our investments as a Victorian government, um, I've got to say, have exceeded any other states. And we invested 240 million over four years out of um, our recent budget to progress the break the cycle of family violence and violence against women in our communities. And of this money, about 70 million will go towards ensuring women can access safe accommodation when they need it by delivering to new core um, and cluster refuges, funding the refurbishment and operation of existing facilities and purchasing six new accommodation properties suitable for individual families. And investments like this build upon initiatives like Viv's Place, um, delivered by Launch um, Housing and Uniting Victaz, 
and proudly supported by our government um, with an investment of more than 13 million. Another Australian first, Viv's Place itself can um, permanently house up to 200 mothers and their children escaping family violence or at risk of experiencing homelessness. This is an amazing in an initiative and of course is part of Victoria's historic $5.3 billion investment in big housing build, which is the largest social and affordable housing build program in this state's history. I'd like to again take the opportunity to thank everyone here today for your advocacy, for your work. I know this is a space where you don't always get accolades for your work, but it's absolute privilege to work alongside of you in a government that I know is committed to trying to improve women's access to safe, uh, appropriate and affordable housing. There's a lot more work to do, I understand that, um, but uh, in launching this uh, magazine today, Parity, um, and, and the focus on pregnancy and homelessness, this helps to bring stories to light um, for our funders, for our community, for our private sector to understand um, how entrenched, entrenched these topics are in gender equality. So can I do a special shout out to Noel and say thank you um, to him? Yep. Can't see where he, oh, there he is, hiding up the bit, thank you. Yeah, I'm really delighted to be able to officially launch Pregnancy and Homelessness edition of Parity and to say thank you to everyone that's involved. And can I say the artwork's really good as well as the story um, stories, but thank you everyone. got a, a, a grandma pregnancy shot to show off. I was going to put it on the... <laughs> yes, okay. yeah. uh, so, um, Minister, thank you so much. Um, we really do appreciate the commitments of um, the Victorian government uh, in this space. Um, and did I over here say something about ongoing funding for the Keneally Grant? Uh, but I will clarify that later. Yeah, it, it will, we'll be right behind you. Uh, and I do think we are very fortunate to have a, a Minister for Women in this woman, women in this state who has had the personal experiences that you bring to the role and inform your work every day. So we really appreciate you popping in and we understand that you'll need to pop out rather shortly. Thanks. <clears throat> Um, if I could just uh, go back to uh, the, the, the references to homeless, Homelessness Week next week and um, remind you, you've still got an opportunity to register for our event on Monday and also that uh, the following week we've got our National Homelessness Conference and it's not too late to register either in person or online. For that, you wouldn't want to miss it. It's going to be. We've got Minister Julie Collins opening both events. Um, <clears throat> Now we, we move on to the more in-depth part of uh, this um, forum today and uh, to kick that off uh, our keynote speakers I'm really absolutely rapt to be able to introduce Vicky who's a young woman from the Young Mums program in Bendigo and Vicky has uh, very generously come along today and is going to share her lived experience with us. Um, Vicky's been supported by the Young Mums program for over three years now and first commenced that support at uh, 20 weeks of pregnancy. And uh, Linda's going to be with her for a, a bit of support during the presentation, but welcome Vicky. Hi, I'm a little nervous, so just bear with me. Um, my time at Young Mother Baby Program and how it's changed my life forever. Uh, before I was accepted into Young Mother Baby Program, I was homeless, five months pregnant, and was going bed to bed, often, sorry, often unsure of where I was going to sleep. I was at my wits end, my body was completely exhausted, and at times I was sleeping on the train just to get some rest. My whole body, sorry, my whole life fit into a suitcase. I was carting it around from town to town. 
I was trying my hardest to stay strong. When the Young Mother Baby program called me to tell me I'd been accepted into the Young Mother Baby house, I remember crying for an hour because I finally had a home. I had somewhere I could feel secure. The Young Mother Baby house has taught me so many things. My cooking skills weren't very good before I moved in, and since then my cooking and baking is nothing less than amazing. <laughs> um, I always knew that I would be a good mother, but thanks to Young Mother Baby, I am an exceptional mother. The Young Mother Baby took me to all my maternity appointments. They gave me so much support, and all the classes I have taken at Young Mother Baby have helped me to understand my daughter and also help understand myself as a mother. Thanks to them, I am a patient, caring, and loving mother. After I had my daughter, I had quite a few complications, and because I was too tired, I ignored them. If it wasn't for Linda pushing me to see a doctor and trying her best to support me, I would have got a lot sicker than I did. Every single night for months, a caregiver would sit with me while I breastfed my daughter, because I often was so tired that I would fall asleep with her in my arms. Every single time I doubted myself, young mother baby were there to pick me back up. They supported me in every single way. I don't know where I would be without them. Um, I've learned not only living skills, but I have learned life skills that I will continue to use throughout my journey. A couple of weeks after I had my daughter, my postnatal depression and anxiety got really bad and made me feel like a bad mum. The young mother baby were always there supporting me in counselling appointments. They were there every morning with my tablet. They were just always there. Now I'm living independently. I have reached my goal. I have times where I struggle, but I know I'm not alone. I have young mother baby supporting me. I have no family here in Bendigo, but the caregivers at young mother baby are the closest thing I have to a family. The young mother baby program has made me strong. They have made me kind and patient and more understanding. They have made me a great mother, a good friend, and most of all, a strong, independent woman. And there will never be enough words to express just how grateful I am for everything they have done and continue to do for me. Last year, I completed my Cert for in Community Services, and I'm currently studying a Cert for in Mental Health. So if you want to devote your time and effort and passion towards something, organisations like Young Mother Baby don't just change lives, they save them. Thank you. Wow, Vicky, um, you didn't look nervous at all. And I mean, thank you so much for um, sharing and uh, bringing to life both the issues and what needs to be done about them. And you couldn't have done it, uh, I think, in a, in a more moving way. So thank you. Now, uh, other keynote speakers <clears throat> involve the perspective of three academics who are very important to our sector. Um, so firstly, we've got Juliet Watson. Good to see you, Juliet. These masks, yeah, and yeah, we've got Juliet and Jackie Theobald together, but I'll tell you a little bit about both of them first. Um, so Juliet's a senior lecturer in the School of Global Urban and Social Studies at RMIT, and she's Vice President of the Australian Women's and Gender Studies Association. She's a social worker, a sociologist. She was previously Deputy Director of the Unison Housing Research Lab, where she designed and coordinated the social work undergraduate course on uh, homelessness. And uh, with um, Juliet, we've got um, someone known to us all, but Dr. Jackie Theobald, um, who's a senior lecturer in social work and social policy at La Trobe University in Bendigo. And Jackie's primary uh, research interests include the historical and contemporary context of domestic violence, services, gendered violence, women's homelessness and their related social policy and practice responses. And uh, with so Sue Ellen Murray, she's the author of the From Margins to the Mainstream, the Domestic Violence Services Movement in Victoria uh, over the period from 1974 to 2016. So over to you too. Jenny. Well, hi everyone. Um, Vicky, we're a bit nervous too, especially as we thought we were going to have a PowerPoint presentation. So just bear with us as we adapt as we go. 
Um, I would just like to start by acknowledging that we're on Wurundjeri lands and that the research that we will be talking about today was conducted on Wurundjeri lands. I'd like to thank Parity, CHP, Jenny, and in particular, Noel, who you know where he is somewhere. <laughs> He's moving around. <laughs> thank you, Noel. Um, I'll just add my um, congratulations to CHP on putting together another fabulous edition. And Jackie and I were looking through it. We've looked through it and said, this is great for us as researchers. So <laughs> we, we see it with researchers' eyes, ready to mine it for more that we can do with this. Um, I'm going to start by saying that not all people who are pregnant are women, um, but our research has mostly focused on cisgender women. So this is a constraint that needs to be kept in mind when we talk about our research today. We're also going to be talking about some challenging issues. Um, so please, you know, look after yourselves if you're hearing things that are a bit difficult to hear. It was wonderful to hear Vicky's experiences and I mean it, I think it resonated with the two of us as researchers because Vicky is not alone in her experience. Um, this is shared by many, many women um, and uh, we're going to actually start with another story which is a young woman we interviewed, a 22 year old woman, um, Bianca, who was one of 14 women who we interviewed as part of our research and she was seven months pregnant. Um, when Jackie met her, I think Jackie, you you interviewed her, um, but she'd been kicked out of home at the age of 15 after sticking up for her mother who was in an abusive relationship. And since then she'd moved around a lot. She'd spent time on the streets, she'd been in refuges, she'd lived with various relatives. And these experience had, experiences had been compounded by previous, previous experiences of trauma that had left her feeling really isolated. So she and her partner were living in a car when she found out that she was pregnant. Now one night they managed to scrape together enough money to spend one night in a cheap hotel uh, at the end of a, a long day at a family celebration. And she told us this, it was my niece's second birthday. So we were going to her birthday party and then we were going to just go to the hotel and just have a relaxing night, try and get a good night's sleep. We got back to the hotel room at 3 a.m. Uh, and we had to be out of there by 10 a.m. There was no time to rest. I started bleeding and I was like, wow, what's going on? Like, this is scary. So I went to the hospital and they confirmed a miscarriage. Now they only had the hotel room for one night, which meant that for Bianca, she was tending to her bodily needs around them, you know, such as blood clotting, et cetera, around the effects of the miscarriage in public toilets. A few months later, Bianca was pregnant again and still living in her car. And she said, my boot was full, my back seat was full. So literally all I had was my front seat, to, front seat to sleep in. And it was the worst, but I dealt with it. This became more and more difficult living out of the car. It was winter, she was getting more pregnant. She said, I always stank, even though I was showering every day because I was going to the swimming pool every day just to have a shower. But it was just getting harder and harder because you'd walk into the shower, you'd want to stay in there for hours, but you couldn't because the water goes cold. So at a time when most expectant parents are focusing on their pregnancy and making plans for their future family, the uncertainty around Bianca's housing meant that her energy was directed to surviving each and every day, trying to find somewhere to live. We interviewed Bianca. We'd like to talk to you a bit more about um, the broader context of our research and I'll hand that over to Jackie. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to just provide a bit of a brief overview of a couple of research projects that we undertook a few years ago now over 2018 and 2019. Um, and the impetus for the first stage of the project that we did in 2018 really came from advocates within the homelessness sector. So I really want to acknowledge that because it was staff in the homelessness sector that identified a critical gap in service system responses to women that were pregnant and homeless. And I want to acknowledge the leadership of Dr. Heather Holst, who was at a launch housing. It was really critical because it led to the first stage of our research getting funding. And of course, that was so important in raising awareness of this issue. Now I really, really want to thank the commitment of our, of our colleague, Professor Suella Murray, who I think is online today, um, who led this research. And this was also really critical and reflected 
her commitment to tackling systemic gender inequality. So thanks to Ellen and Julia, and I would just want to say we've been really honoured to be part of this research um, and to collaborate with other key activists like Dr. Therese Lynch. So um, what were we trying to do? With the first stage of our research, we were really trying to identify and enumerate homeless pregnant women. And, and, and also along with that, think about how effective housing and health service availability was. So we did some interviews and focus groups with about 14 stakeholders across 27 homelessness and health agencies. And we had an expert reference group that oversaw that. So I want to acknowledge um, Launch Housing, the Royal Women's Hospital, Victorian Department of Health and Services, and there, and there are other specialist services as well. The second part of our research, which we did largely over 2019, was really informed by the findings of stage one. This was also led by Professor Murray, and we were really lucky to be joined by Frida Haylett, Dr. Frida Haylett as well. So we built on the first stage, and this was enabled by funding from the Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation. So I want to acknowledge Erin Dolan, who really supported our vision and saw the importance of hearing the voices of women's experience. So our focus then shifted to thinking about you know, investigating and highlighting women's experiences and also thinking more about, okay, how can we think about a strategy now for developing appropriate service and policy responses? So I'm just going to talk about some key findings and I'm going to start by talking about some findings around housing. Um, Juliet's going to talk a little bit more around some of the pregnancy specific things. And as Juliet said, we, we thought we might have slides. So I did have some quotes. So occasionally I've got here, refer to quote, but you won't be able to do that. But we have actually brought some copies of, of the reports that are over on the table over there. So um, please feel free to, to grab one of those. Um, so it became quickly apparent in the first stage of our research that data okay, on pregnancy um, was not really available. So we don't, we, you know, there's no known data on prevalence and it, it's a very hidden issue. So it's a hidden, hidden issue, right? Because we already know the invisibility around women's homelessness, but this aspect of it is particularly invisible. So no consistency in data collection in what was being collected. So we, we don't know the prevalence. Now this, of course, makes it really difficult to provide adequate and appropriate services. But we know from research overseas that pregnancy rates are higher amongst women who are homeless and those who are housed. And we also found examples of really great service and innovative programs. But we also found that service provision was ad hoc and lacked coordination. So no surprises to anybody in this room that a key issue was access to long term housing and how limited that is. So those critical shortages in safe, stable and affordable housing really constrained the capacity and continue to constrain the capacity of the homelessness service sector to meet needs and support pregnant homeless women. So as a lot of people here will know, what that means is that in a housing crisis, you know, women might be referred to rooming houses or to stay with family and friends. Um, and this is not sustainable or suitable, particularly once a baby's born. So more broadly, I think, you know, we really found is that, that policy and practice that don't give attention to gender generate exclusionary outcomes. And in this case, pregnant homeless women. And one sort of challenging aspect that, that came up was the kind of linear approach, okay, to, to accessing housing that characterises parts of our system whereby, you know, people need to move up kind of a staircase model of temporary housing and, and where they need to sort of, you know, tackle their problems and, or, and, and get treatment for their problems at the same time. So part of the challenge of this is that it emphasises compliance and it just doesn't account for pregnancy. Um, women with particularly complex needs, which is a lot of the women that, that we spoke to in our second stage of this research, faced a lot of difficulties meeting those kinds of strict requirements about engaging in support. But we also found that pregnancy is typically only recognised at late term as an eligibility condition for housing, if at all. And so a key outcome of that and a particular group that um, stood out was single women without children in their care who really face exclusion in the early stages of pregnancy from access to medium term housing options like transitional housing, for example. So what was it like for women being homeless and where did they stay? They, they stayed in various forms of accommodation, the women that we spoke to, rooming houses, hotels, cars, couch surfing, sleeping rough. Um, and they told us that their safety was undermined. So particularly masculine dominated spaces where exposure to environmental violence was common. This above quote, just kidding, um, you know, women told us about this had impacts on 
um, their safety, so the, the safety of their space and amenities, capacity to be comfortable, capacity to be private, um, practical elements, obtaining fresh, fresh and nutritional food was also particularly difficult in rooming houses as well as for those living in cars. Um, exposure to um, intimate partner violence, sexual violence and drug and alcohol use, particularly for women who were couch surfing was really common and women were involved in survival sex situations as well. So the, the broader context that, that we all know about is lack of affordable housing in Australia, which is combined with the policy of not prioritising access to accommodation for women until late in their pregnancy or immediately after birth has significant implications. Okay, it's really stressful for women. And I think, you know, we, we got a good grasp of that from, from your talk, thank you. Um, and it undermines an ability to stabilise and plan and prepare for motherhood. Um, and um, I had a really good quote for that, but it'll be in, in, the, in, the, in the report. <laughs> um, there are also particular challenges for pregnant women in supported accommodation as well. Things like, um, um, things just not being designed appropriately, stairs while heavily pregnant, concerns about safety um, in other in other, from other residents, et cetera. Um, so there were a range of challenges. Um, proximity, needing to travel far to get to services, um, all of these issues came up. And look, for the women that we interviewed in that second stage, housing outcomes for the voting participants were just inadequate and unjust. Um, at the time of interview, most participants were still not permanently housed. 10 remained homeless, including two of the three pregnant women. And of the 11 women with babies, 10 were homeless at their birth. Okay, Juliet, thank you. Which leads me into talking about what it's like to be pregnant when you're homeless. Um, so as we noted with Bianca at the beginning, it's a common experience for women to be homeless and pregnant and have experienced past and be experiencing current trauma. So life doesn't just stop because you're pregnant. You're still, you're still kind of living with what's led you to be homeless and what's going on while you're homeless. We had nine of the 14 women um, disclose that they'd experienced trauma such as family violence, child and or adult sexual assault, for example. And those who didn't disclose trauma still spoke about experiences of insecure housing, um, hazardous alcohol and drug use, incarceration, and struggles with their mental health, and that these factors had contributed to them becoming homeless. Now, the pregnancies were often very welcome by the women. You know, it's not, it's not a, a terrible event <laughs> for women to become pregnant. Um, and, but for most of the women, it was a surprise. Uh, we weren't speaking to many women where these were planned pregnancies, but they were often very welcome. Um, but what we learnt from the services we spoke to and from the women is that they often didn't find out that they were pregnant, pregnant until quite late in their pregnancies. There was so much going on that the women were kind of disconnecting from their bodies. There, there was too much going on to focus on to worry about the pregnancy. We had one woman who did not know she was pregnant until she was actually giving birth. Now, that's not isolated to homelessness, of course, that, that can happen <laughs> anywhere, but her circumstances absolutely contributed to that. Um, and we found that their experiences of finding out about being pregnancy really were you know, if it was a positive or a negative experience, really kind of depended on what else was going on in their lives. Again, not that different from the vast majority of becoming pregnant. I think one of the, you know, the critical things to remember is pregnancy is pregnancy. It's what's kind of going on around that can affect what's going on. But these, you know, women who are homeless and pregnant have the same needs, desires, etc., love for their baby that 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 all pregnant people do. Um, it can be a very dangerous time though. We know that um, pregnancy is a trigger for family and domestic violence. And for some, we saw women uh, experience more abuse in their relationships at that time. Um, and for some, it was a catalyst for greater insecurity. So women may have managed to get some accommodation, but then it just was no longer available. They could not have a baby in that environment in which they were living.
We know from previous research and from our own research that uh, pregnant homeless women face all sorts of barriers when engaging with antenatal care. Um, and some of the reasons can be that one, they, they don't know they're pregnant for a period of time, so they miss out on a lot of that critical care. They've disconnected with their bodies. There can be a real fear about what engaging with antenatal care will, will mean and a fear that they will lose their babies in some way, that, that there will be child protection involvement, that it's if we stay away, <laughs> they won't know about the baby and they won't take our baby, even though we know that actually engagement with services is a much stronger indicator of being able to stay with your baby. Um, and it can just be the, the chaos associated with being homeless that keeps women from being able to access different services. Pregnant women experiencing homelessness also have higher rates of complications with their pregnancies. And we saw this with our participants as well, where we had participants who'd experienced gestational diabetes, preeclampsia and low blood pressure. But also what came with this is a real sense of shame that women feel about what they might be doing to their babies. You know, this real sense of guilt for circumstances that are so beyond their control. These things that they, that they have no control over, but worried that they're somehow passing on this to their babies, that they're bringing their babies into this world and it's all their fault if things aren't going well. It came across so strongly that we also want to make the point that not all pregnancies result in a live birth. Bianca talked about having a miscarriage with her first pregnancy. Um, and there is no special response for homeless women who miscarry. If they do go to hospital, they're back to their circumstances that they experienced before. Same if they have a stillbirth. <clears throat> and for some women, they may choose to have an abortion. And of our participants, six had contemplated having an abortion. One of our health um, support people we spoke to um, spoke very passionately about how women's choices were being you know, dictated because they couldn't find housing, that it was such a basic human right that was denied them, that was actually uh, leading to choices that they were being forced to make about their future families. So uh, some of the reasons that women might seek out an abortion included not having suitable housing for the baby, um, being pregnant, leading to homelessness, so it could lead to, uh, lead to breakdown in family relationships, or it just might be that the housing was not suitable. Again, the fear of the baby being taken away and the chaos that they were experiencing. And we certainly had women who actually spoke quite passionately about not believing in abortion for themselves uh, and yet still contemplating abortion. So they were having to go against their own personal beliefs um, in what they were contemplating. Um, now we had one woman who actually went as far as booking an appointment for an abortion. She booked several appointments, but she had no way of getting to the appointment. So she wasn't even able to access the service that she wanted because she couldn't get there. The lift just kept falling through. She couldn't get there. I do want to, and, and this led to her attempting suicide because she felt her life was just falling apart so much. I want to say that Donna, this woman, is now very happy to be a mother and things are going well, but she was denied those choices at the time. I also want you to think about for a moment um, when, you know, those of you who have children in the room or are potentially thinking of children, if you have been pregnant or have a partner who's been pregnant, um, you're planning for the baby to come, generally. You're buying things for the baby, you're setting up the space, you're buying nappies, clothes. You're thinking about what kind of parent you want to be. You're thinking things like, will I breastfeed or won't I breastfeed or for how long? Even as far as what school am I going to send this child to? Do I need to move to a new area? This is just too much to contemplate for women who are homeless because there are far more pressing concerns. So there's this real, real critical period for them where they're not actually getting to bond with their child and think about their futures as parents. However, we also know that this is a real turning point for women, that pregnancy can really provide opportunities that they, women couldn't see for themselves before. And as service providers, this is really, you know, really important for us to know. So women who have perhaps 
you know, avoided services, avoided things that they might have liked to change in their lives up until now, have an impetus to do this for their babies when they couldn't necessarily do it for themselves. So it is an exciting time. The outcomes can be really incredible for women who do engage with services at this time and, you know, go on to be incredible mothers. Um, through that. I think we're going to be talking more about the Cornelia project, uh, so I won't say, spend too much time on that other than to say that um, the Pregnancy and Homelessness Network that Teresa is going to be talking about has been heavily involved, <laughs> and Teresa in particular for acquiring funding for that. Um, it's an incredible service. We're really excited about it. It's a wonderful um, coming together of research that's been done, passionate advocates in the sector and, you know, money being put forward. So things are changing. There are really exciting things afoot at the moment. So thank you, everyone. Thanks heaps, Juliet and Jackie. And I think what you've had to say, um, you know, is a really wonderful example of you know, the, the, the nexus, the interface between um, lived experience, uh, the expertise of the sector and uh, research expertise. So um, it's exciting knowledge that's being generated um, at that interface. Uh, now, we have one more keynote speaker before we move to our panel, and that is Teresa Lynch, Dr. Teresa Lynch, who's the convener of the Pregnancy and Homelessness Network. And uh, Teresa's been a social worker for 35 years, so that puts you right in my uh, ballpark there, Teresa. Um, and for more than 11 of those years, she managed the Victorian Royal Women's Hospital Drug and Alcohol Service, providing uh, specialised multidisciplinary clinical care um, to pregnant women and infants impacted by complex drug and alcohol use. Uh, Teresa has been part of the women's team uh, in partnership with Housing First Limited and Launch Housing, who are uh, sponsors of this edition. In and she led the vision that uh, saw the establishment of the Cornelia Program, an Australian first in providing safety support and a secure home for pregnant women and babies, as we've heard uh, throughout this event. She is the convener uh, of the network, which advocates for system and policy change so that homeless pregnant women have access to a range of service models to improve women's and newborns health and wellbeing. And, and I think it's the model that we can all look to. So over to you, Teresa. Do I? <laughs> What, a, um, what an honour to be here today, a uh, real privilege and uh, yeah, I'm just, and I'm a, it's an honour to have an honorary role as convener of the Homelessness Pregnancy Network. So I, I'll try to stick to my 10 minutes. Okay. So firstly, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and give respect to elders past, present and emerging. Um, things I'm going to talk about today are things that we, we've, we've spoken about at length, but it, it's worth me reiterating some of the key points. Homeless pregnant women are among the most vulnerable members of our community, and yet their voices are rarely heard. My article in Parity tells the story of a coalition of organisations and individuals who have formed a movement, call it our movement, to make their stories visible and to improve their lives. Through our collective efforts, we aim to disrupt the policies and practices that deny pregnant women access to health treatment, just and compassionate care, and stable and safe housing. Uh, for those of us who do have a few decades under our belts of working in the women's movement, we would know that since the 1970s, there's been a worldwide movement to promote and protect the human rights and fundamental freedoms of women Networks and coalitions of women have worked for decades to ensure women enjoy cultural, economic, political and social development. But recent events globally tell us that women's rights remain a risk and there is still much more work to be done. There continue to be a number of complex, critical and stigmatised areas of women's health where barriers and service gaps 
affect women's capacity to access responsive and comprehensive care. This is particularly true in the areas of where homeless pregnant women seek access to stable housing and maternity care and therapeutic support. As we have heard today, the lack of stable housing and the stress of homelessness profoundly undermines women's ability to access health care and particularly pregnancy care. This in turn creates immediate and long lasting harm to women in their child's health and well-being. As we've heard, their ability to bond and care with their child and keep them safe. For many, the, the, for many women, the inability to find suitable housing prior to birth will result in the removal of their baby from a care. As a feminist who has worked in the trenches of women's health for a few decades, I have witnessed the sufferings of vulnerable pregnant women and babies extensively. Their anguish and often misery are born out of traumatic and violent life experiences and, although, and also brought about by policies and practices across our service systems that often judge, discriminate, neglect and exclude them. I can tell you a few stories. I can tell you a story. Um, my kids actually um, said to me last night if I had a chance to tell some of these stories, but I'll be brief because we don't have much time. But I can tell you a story about a young woman who was found in the gutter unconscious. She was actually a young woman brought over from North Korea and trafficked here into Victoria. She was unconscious because she wanted to end her life. When she came into emergency care, it was found then that she was actually pregnant. That pregnancy gave her a reason to live. I can tell you a story about an Indigenous woman who was pregnant with twins. She was actually um, experiencing um, an addiction to methamphetamine use and, and not having stable housing. Because she was with twins, her babies were born prematurely and they spent an extensive period of time in, in care at the women's hospital. Despite this mother um, daily attending to the cares of her children, um, and despite being assessed as being an excellent mother, she was, when the babies were discharged, she was actually separated from her twins. Not only was she separated from her twins, the twins were actually separated from each other. So for, it took a total of over 18 months for that family to be reconnected. Uh, if that's not harsh, if that's not discriminatory, if that doesn't break your heart, then I don't know what would. I, was like, I can also tell you a story about a young woman that I met in the emergency department at the Royal, Women, at the Royal Melbourne Hospital who had turned up um, battered and bruised from another assault from her partner. She was at the time pregnant with her second child. She had already lost her first child. This young woman went on to um, not have the care of her second child. She was unable, despite best efforts, to be able to stabilise herself appropriately. She went on, as I understand it, to have an, another two children. All of them are out of her care. This is because of policies and practices that discriminate against these young women. But in thinking about these women's rights, we must also give equal attention to the rights of the unborn baby. And you'll notice in the parody article, Dr. Anna Tottenman writes in her article, and I'm going to quote her directly, a mother's fetus is not merely a passive observer to adverse maternal experiences. From the moment of conception to the child's second birthday, the first thousand days of human development represents the most rapid period of growth and maturation within the human life course and a period exquisitely sensitive to external influences. So one thing about working with the women's for over, it was almost 14 years. The thing that we learn that is it imperative that we provide antenatal care early in pregnancy and continue with postnatal support to the mother and paediatric support to the infant for at least two years. We know that if support is removed before six months, both their lives, mother and child, will, will unravel poorly. So in response to these experiences of vulnerable women and babies having unequal access to healthcare and housing support, and an alliance of housing and drug and alcohol services in Victoria was first formed and supported by the Royal Women's Hospital in 2014. 
So the goal was to develop new and innovative solutions to improve vulnerable mothers' direct access to maternity care, outreach support, and connections to housing services. The work of this early alliance during a two-year period was critical in driving initiatives and building knowledge and relationships to improve health care for homeless pregnant women and in Victoria. However, the struggle to dismantle the discrimination, social and economic disadvantages of vulnerable pregnant women still prevailed, and they still prevail today. But in this period after, in 2016, workers across the health and housing sectors, oops, shaky hands, undertake action, undertook, oh, this way, continue to undertake actions to raise the public consciousness of the situation facing homeless pregnant women. So what it led to is the action of women leaders working together across several organisations ultimately led to a three-stage research project, which um, Jackie and Juliet have just spoken about, so I won't go into great details, but that was quite critical and it, and it um, reminds us about the importance of advocacy and women working together and, and following feminist practice. And, so important to this project is the research addressed ways to improve service and policy responses and standards of care for vulnerable pregnant women and newborns. Today, it really is a landmark piece of research and it offers us the recommendations, and the ideas and the initiatives which we need to continue to drive. But the study, as, as Juliet and Jackie have said, found that being pregnant did not necessarily afford the women greater access to housing support or secure accommodation and highlighted serious gaps in the service system. One of the facts I was looking up recently, um, an article from the Los Angeles Times came across my phone and it said, although we don't have the data in, in Australia about how many pregnant women exist, you know, in America, the research over there says that um, homeless pregnant women are five times more likely to be pregnant than housed women. It's quite extraordinary. So, but I'll go back to my script. But the Pregnancy and Homelessness Network was officially formed at the Pregnancy and Homelessness Cross Sector Forum, which was led from the research. This is a, a very important time in history, and it was hosted by RMIT in November 2019. So, this was when our movement was birthed, I would say. So, inspired by the combined energies, aspirations and efforts of organisations and women with lived experience of homelessness, this new movement emerged for homeless pregnant women and their infants. The network consists of a coordinating group representing over 25 health, health and housing services across Victoria. And recently, um, Lutheran Care from South Australia have come on board, so that's nice. We think we're going to be a, um, an Australian-wide alliance. We need to be. So we're working together to, for change to transform health, social and housing support that will lead to safe, safe and healthy lives for pregnant homeless women and their infants. The network is an important vehicle for leveraging expertise and resources to improve access to services and support to vulnerable homeless pregnant women. It provides advocacy, strategic support for advancing further research and policy and practice changes to improve their health and social outcomes. An important focus is the creation of educational activities that build the capacity of staff across the sectors of health, housing and welfare to improve the standards of care for vulnerable pregnant women and their infants and to give them easy access to safe, stable and affordable housing. Achievements of the network uh, have included a self-assessment tool, and I can see Kerry Fellman over <laughs> who actually helped to design that, but it was a pretty critical piece of research that was actually answered and um, we had over 172 responses and it provided really robust evidence that services require knowledge and skills to enhance their expertise to ex access support, care and treat pregnant women and their, and their children. And effectively that um, piece of that a tool has really driven our network's efforts to publish this edition of Parity. Parity and I must say, I must take this opportunity to thank all of the the coordinating group because getting this parity up and running has been a, a, a monumentous occasion and everyone's thanking um, Noel but I'll thank him again so I'll take the time out to thank him. Um, it's driven, so the, the network also has aspirations of, of developing short e-learning modules uh, and we've also 
we do have to thank the Council of Homes and Persons, Jennies, because you um, also, um, if you're not already aware, made a commitment <laughs> to helping us to do these <laughs> short e-learning modules. So sorry to say that to you publicly, but we will be working together, <laughs> hopefully. Yeah, sounds, like a, sounds like a great idea. <laughs> And uh, and I've still got on our on our agenda um, to do a women's conference. Determined to have that up and running. For those who don't know, there's not been a women's conference, particularly in the area of drug and alcohol, ever since the 1980s. I think in Victoria we are well and truly overdue for a women's conference. Uh, as part of our activities, and this is in my articles, we have actually also forwarded submissions. So we've done a pretty handy job over the last. Uh, I want to, on behalf of the network, also acknowledge and celebrate the remarkable achievement of the official launch of the Cormier. I think it's just, it's a, it's, as, as we've all said, it's a landmark. It's actually, for me, it's, uh, I have to keep pinching myself every time I hear about the program. It's pretty extraordinary. And but what this action has, in getting that up and running, it's really reinforced the importance of sustained advocacy in transforming the conditions in the lives of vulnerable women and children through the offering of services. It actually inspires further contributions to social change for pregnant women living. An interesting story is that when we were celebrating the achievement of the official launch of the Cornelia project in, in, the, in our network meeting um, within about 30 seconds. We had 30 seconds to celebrate that when some wonderful woman um, said started to talk about the idea of um, in expanding our advocacy efforts to include the improvement of options for housing for women with multiple children. <laughs> so I said, yes, we're in. We're all in. So that's our next goal. So for those who, know, who probably understand this more than I do, but we understand that um, in the housing sector, large families do not also have long-term housing options and can, not, can end up waiting on the Victorian Housing Register with no support. And they too cycle through the system through multiple forms of temporary accommodation. So philanthropic support is being sought as a way of continuing our advocacy role for this activity and potentially other activities of the network. So while our movement is relatively new, it is built on the successes and learnings of earlier feminist movements based on principles of idealism, optimism, determination and collective action. There is a belief that working together we can prevail in producing social changes and social policies for the most marginalised and disadvantaged women and children. We know pregnancy is an important time when women a willingness to make significant changes and engage with support services, thus providing a really critical window of opportunity for early intervention to improve maternal and infant outcomes. We know that women can make positive changes if given the opportunity to do so. It is a network's mission to provide all vulnerable, homeless, pregnant women the best possible opportunities to change their circumstances. We hope to inspire others to join our movement and encourage the philanthropic community and government, if you're here, <laughs> to actually support our advocacy efforts. And we look forward to working with you all together and we welcome warm warmly, very warmly, new members to our network. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks, Teresa. Um, no, thanks for sharing your expertise and for showing inspirational leadership that you have with the network. And as I reflected in the editorial, I think it, you know it's sort of gobsmacking that remains a volunteer effort. But um, well, we weren't on Minister Hutchins' radar before. Perhaps we are now. So that's quite good. Um, so now we move to our fabulous panel, which is going to explore the extent and nature and impact of homelessness on pregnancy outcomes for mother and infant. And the way this is going to work is that I'm going to introduce the panel and then get out of your way um, for a, a while. And what I'd suggest is uh, as I introduce each panel member, that person comes up so people can kind of put the face to the uh, description. Um, so firstly, I'm going to introduce uh, Sally Coots. 
uh, who's the manager of the Cornelia program at the Royal Women's, who is going to be the moderator of the panel. <clears throat> and uh, Sally will be well known to many of you as prior coming to the women's, Sally worked as a policy advisor at Beyond Blue, and but she spent uh, 20 years at the Salvation Army in their crisis services area, including 10 years as manager of the 24-hour statewide crisis centre in St Kilda, and 12 years of manager of research and program development at the Salvation Army Crisis Service Network. Everybody else. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then we go to the panel members. Um, so we've got Laura Marnie, who's the Chief Impact Officer at Launch Housing, one of our great sponsors of this edition. Thank you. Um, Laura's an experienced leader in strategic uh, planning, policy reform and implementation and uh, in the delivery of complex program evaluations and organisation reviews, which is an invaluable thing to be able to do. Um, and earlier in her career, Laura spent time in policy roles across youth education infrastructure sectors before moving into consulting where she was a partner at, at the Cube Group. So some evaluation expertise there. Um, then Kate Meckham, um, who's the policy manager at Safe and Equal, and um, Kate's from our colleague Peak Body for um, specialist family violence services. Uh, you know, following the um, merger of DV Vic and a domestic violence resource centre (DVRC), and Kate's uh, had uh, over a decade of experience working in Victorian social policy and advocacy in not-for-profit and uh, also in the political arena in Victoria. And then we have Rose McCrowan, who's the manager of Curran Place Mother and Baby Residential Withdrawal Services for Uniting uh, Big Taz. And uh, Rose has worked extensively in AOD since the early 90s and in 2009 became Victoria's first alcohol and drugs nurse practitioner, which is you know, a fantastic thing. To, to, to be. Um, Rose manages current place, nighting 16 bed, um, residential adult and mother baby withdrawal service with four mother baby beds, which is Victoria's only state funded AOD mother baby beds. Uh, and then we have Lisa Abt, who's the manager of social impact and growth at Task Force, who's again uh, supported this edition. Lisa is the executive manager of social impact, yes, and she's worked for 20 years with a focus on individuals and multiple needs, um, with a focus on individuals with multiple needs and often falling through system gaps. Um, Lisa's passion is about improving the way we support our most vulnerable through policy reform and improving program design. And she's seen the outcomes that can be achieved when we work collaboratively across sectors, giving women and children the best opportunity to thrive. And it's hard, yeah, come. <clears throat> And then we have Giovanna Savine, who's the Chief Resident Services Officer at uh, another sponsor, Housing First Limited. In her work, Giovanna aims to support sustainable tenancies and build strong communities through direct service delivery and strategic partnerships. And one of those partnerships is, is the Homeless Mothers and Babies Cornelia Program at the Botanical Apartments. And finally on the panel, we have Suzanne Wells, um, who's the state manager for Youth Services East, um, John of God Healthcare. And Suzanne has worked for more than 20 years in the community sector, local, state, government, strategic and operational leadership. And she's currently um, with the Horizon House program, playing a leadership role um, with the Outreach Youth Services, including the establishment of a young mother and baby program in Bendigo. So welcome to our panel. Give them a round of applause before they get going. And I'll hand you over. Thank you, Jenny. I think I'm going to sit down so that I can pass. Can't do both. I have to say, I think I left a meeting early and ended up with this job, Therese. <laughs> um, and they're a very talkative bunch, so I have no qualms that are going to fill the time. We just need to keep to time. Um, so thank you for the opportunity um, and for the organisers. Um, I'd like to acknowledge also that we're meeting on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So we do have an amazing bunch of people. Um, and we, when we had planned the panel, we weren't 
going to answer everything in this you know, sequential order. So I'm happy for the microphone to be passed back and forth. Um, I am the manager of the Cornelia program. I wasn't going to speak a lot about that because um, it, there's a lot of references within the parity and I know that the partners um, will be mentioning it as well, except to say that it, we were almost at the 12 month mark of operation and um, it's been an amazing journey to be part of. And I would like to um, acknowledge the women who have been through the program. We've had um, up to 40 babies born in the past 12 months. So that's, um, you know, an acknowledgement of their strength and resilience and the support of um, the collaboration between the three organisations is what makes, makes the program successful. So um, that's all I want to say about Cornelia today. Um, apart from acknowledging the staff that are here and the staff that are online and the wonderful work they do as well. So thank you. Um, Jenny's already outlined the aim of this panel. I think, I think what's different perhaps to the speakers before is that we are really wanting to discuss from a service delivery perspective, um, what are some of the challenges and some of the successes of um, working with this vulnerable group. Um, I think I'll get everyone to introduce just their, their names and the organisation they sit within and perhaps just talk about how they work um, with homeless mums and bubs and what some of the challenges are. So if you're happy, Laura, I'll start with you. Thank you. Thanks, Ali. Um, so I am Laura Marnie from Launch Housing and we actually work with mums and um, people who are caring for children at various stages, including while they're pregnant, particularly through our um, the Cornelia program and our pregnancy outreach program. And we also work with them at various other stages. We um, have our, our pregnancy outreach program involves people who are currently experiencing homeless, homelessness, um, insecure housing. We also um, have a families crisis accommodation service, as well as a few other um, crisis facilities where we help women who are in hotels or who are living with us in those spaces. And then we've just opened or taken our first families into Viv's place, which is at the other end of the spectrum where we're helping women find longer term settlement into um, secure housing, links to schools, link, links to community services to help stabilise and allow both the women and their children to experience their life and go into what they want it to be. Thank you. Um, my name's Kate Beacom. I'm the policy manager at Safe and Equal. So we're the peak body for specialist family violence services and don't actually do any direct service delivery. So I can't um, really speak to that specifically, but can speak to the family violence sector as a whole. And um, I think the links are well known in this room between pregnancy and homelessness and the experience of family violence. Um, I'd say that the family violence sector comes into contact with um, women or people who are pregnant um, when they're experiencing quite acute and immediate family violence risk, um, as opposed to um, women who've experienced family violence where maybe that risk is less immediate or less um, serious, and then they would end up in the housing and homelessness system, unfortunately. Um, and I think we don't have a lot of data as has been mentioned already on um, kind of the prevalence of women who are pregnant in our system. We do know um, they are there. Some of the only recent statistics I've seen recently is Safe and Equal um, try to do some data collection to get a good picture of um, capacity in the family violence system compared to demand. And um, we didn't really get a clear number of the number of um, women in the system who were pregnant, but that they were among the top um, client cohorts who were unlikely to have their needs met because of the lack of housing and all of the um, co-occurring medical and other needs that they have, which we've discussed already. So um, I'm sure we have some time to keep discussing it as the panel goes, but that's um, being safe and equal in a snapshot. Sorry, I have to be more mask attentive because, you know, we kind of run out of nurses. And... <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Rose McCrowan and I've got the wonderful job of managing Victoria's only state funded mother baby beds. And what's been awesome for Uniting is we had started to do that anyway. 
And so in the end, the government funded us with this fantastic line in the proposal to say, we actually don't have the evidence, but we know anecdotally that there's a need for this service. And I think it does speak to what others have said about how invisible um, the homelessness issue, and even just the dealing with uh, pregnant women beyond the, the specialist maternity services. And when we had when we set up, we had this grand vision that babies of four to six months old would come along with the mother. And uh, Chantelle, who's here today, who evaluated our service after the first uh, couple of years, it's really clear that we have become the step down facility for the specialist maternity services. So the Royal Women's and particularly the Mercy Hospital, which is how we ended up becoming a step in then the Cornelia program. And one of the, thing, the key things that I wanted to say was despite all the amazing work that can be done antenatally, often our experience is that the mother is actually very invisible in the process other than specialist maternity services. And she may have a vision that it will be a, a, a normal family and that the partner will remain involved and we've seen a lot of examples, particularly with meth methamphetamine use, where the paternity is being questioned. I am stunned at how many fathers are not involved in, like we rarely see a father. They're either locked up, so there are a lot of calls to Port Phillip Prison from our facility, but the denial of paternity. And there is a lot of families that are involved because of family violence. And it is only when the mother comes to our facility that space is given from her and she begins to engage in what probably lots of services have been telling her. And that is that for the mother and the infant to remain together, they will actually have to remove themselves from the situation of violence. And we get the privilege of watching this unbelievable mother and uh, infant bond grow and develop, and the realisation for this mother that she will actually have to move beyond this relationship. And um, I also, the other thing that I found really, really uh, shocking was to realise how many cases uh, where the, if there's a, a query about whether or not the lady is using substances, the default position was to remove the infant. And when I look at the just under 300 women that have come into our program who have had their baby with us, the majority were at risk of that child being removed. And I think that just, like that used to overwhelm me to go, oh my God. But we know that we were funded to reduce the number of children removed in Victoria because we all know then of yet another generation of trauma with the removal of an infant. And I am really pleased with what's happened over the last year. We're getting more and more women who are getting the opportunity to keep the current child, even if they've had three or four other children removed. There's, yeah, so there's some optimism and hope, and we love the Cornelia program. And um, yeah, the part that we can do so that if a, a woman returns to substance use, she doesn't have to lose her home and she doesn't have to lose the baby. So yeah, we're happy to keep playing. Thanks, Rose. Um, I'm Lisa Abbott from Task Force Community Agency. We operate a suite of services predominantly across the South. So um, we became connected with um, the work of the Homelessness and Pregnancy and Homelessness Coordinating Committee because of some work we were doing um, in developing a project that works with women with intersecting needs and young girls that were reported missing or presenting with needs. So um, Task Force are the lead agency on that project. And um, having come from a background of drug and alcohol, it was really apparent that um, where there was women with multiple needs, the access to support was even harder. So it was um, something that wasn't considered in the original project design. And then we started seeing some really young girls, 12, 13, 14, that were pregnant and in really 
risky home situations and then women as well that were homeless and pregnant and often rough sleeping. So that really, um, I guess, gave us an impetus to drive some policy and practice reform. How can we better support these young girls, their families and the mothers um, at an earlier stage across sectors and also look at the change in policy that's required. So it's, you know, Vicky, you, you said I was lucky that I was accepted into the program. And it's brilliant that you are and, and that you were and, and the outcomes that were achieved, but it shouldn't be luck and it shouldn't be that you're accepted. So I think we, you know, as a committee and, and task force is very passionate about changing that to improve access for those most, most marginalised. Hi everyone, um, I'm Giovanna Savini and I'm from Housing First and a bit like what's been mentioned, we're not um, clinical practitioners or support service providers. Our primary focus is long-term housing and myself, Teresa, a bit like yourself, a few decades in the housing sector, um, too often in the long-term housing sector, I came across too many families that were seeking long-term housing to reunify families that had been separated through the lack of safe, secure and affordable housing or too many women um, seeking affordable housing and secure housing to leave family violence and unsafe situations. So um, the product that we provide is, is wonderful and the service we provide, but the partnership with Cornelia Program and the, the ability to provide a service or a program through our housing that it's a transition pathway to long-term housing whilst that support is in place has actually been probably one of the um, highlights I'll certainly carry with my career. And it's the ability to see, and it's that pipeline through. So a lot of women, there's a lot of transitional housing out there, but it's that pipeline through to a long-term housing that often becomes the bottleneck and the challenge. And the, the role that Housing First plays in this, in being able to be that pathway through to that long-term housing is something that we're quite proud of and want to continue to do more of. And a bit like the article in Parity, we are quite unique now. We talk about being the first in Australia and there's issues, there's debate whether it's the first in the world, but certainly a program we're quite proud of, but we don't want to be unique. We don't want to be the one. We want it to be in every city, in everywhere, so that the number of women that have been able to come through is not limited to the few beds that are available in our accommodation. And it's similar, Vicky, to your, your story about being lucky. One of the stories that holds true for me is one of the women who, who speaks about the success of this program for herself and the fact that during the very short time she's now got access back to a child that had been removed from her care, made the statement, I didn't think people like me could live in places like this. And that is so sad and, um, and it's something that we need to continue to advocate for and to continue to get more housing for. And, um, and certainly Housing First is very proud to be part of this partnership and advocating for us to not be unique in this partnership. Hi, I'm Suzanne. I work with St John of God Healthcare Social Outreach. Um, I'm responsible for um, a statewide program. Actually, it's a national program, Horizon House, which focuses on young people at risk of homelessness. Um, 16 to 22. Um, at a national level, we've got a young mother and baby program, one in Bendigo and one in um, the metropolitan area of Perth. Um, we don't receive government funding. So the program um, is a, a step down model, which we call three tiers. So we have a house um, which provides accommodation for young women um, between four young women and six in WA, um, and they can stay there for up to 12 months at staffed. Um, do we then have um, nomination rights and relationships with community housing um, where they, we, they are able to transition for another 12 months? And I actually have a view that that's actually, it would be great if we could provide them with long-term ongoing accommodation in their community, but that's, that's our challenge. Um, and while they're, and then we stay in touch for another another year after that. So it's up to three years they can be involved. Nationally, we um, probably have um, supporting about 30 young women at different stages. Um, the focus of our program is firstly to provide them with a safe space um, that they um, have 
where they're supported. Um, they may be pregnant or they may already have a child. Um, we, the aim is to actually have, it's a self-directed program of support around the development of life skills. I think Vicky reflected well the um, type of program that we operate. I think it's self-directed, so some young women are fairly need more independence. Other young women need more intensive support. So it adapts depending on what um, particular young woman wants. So the most important thing for us is that we listen and we respect their journey and and where they want to go um, is is sort of the cornerstone of what we're doing um, and building that resilience um, as along that journey. I think for me, being young and pregnant is incredibly difficult, particularly if you haven't got family support or you um, 90 percent of our young people have some form of family violence in their background, either in terms of the household they've been living with, partner um, violence. I think that um, it's really important that they we understand the, the, what they're facing in terms of young women in particular, in terms of until they have their child, they're on youth allowance, which is, I think it's 500 and something a fortnight that they've got in terms of income. So it's absolute, their access to affordable accommodation is just non-existence, and which means that leaves them that they're living in lots of environments and around which are completely unsuitable. Um, and I think Vicky described that well. I also think that um, once they've had the child, our biggest problem is transition. We have young people, young mothers moving into temporary accommodation. Like it's good, good partnerships in terms of transition, but we're still waiting after two years for them to get access and our success rate isn't fantastic. Um, our program in Bendigo also there's regional restraints where you've got more limited services uh, and opportunities. The other thing I think it's the other key cornerstone is we don't work independently with the young women. Um, it, we connect them into services as well. So they're, they're part of the community and the aim is to, that they um, can negotiate the, and identify the supports they need, whether it's maternal and child health or community health um, or other services. So, um, yeah, that's a great question. Yes, Jesse, is that policy gaps, service gaps? And I think you've all touched on a number of issues. <laughs> I'm interested, Kate, in, from a family violence perspective and the intersection with homelessness, whether you have a particular perspective that you'd like to add. Um, thanks, Sally. Um, I mean, obviously, where do you start? I think the the glaring one is lack of affordable long term housing, which has impacted everything we do. And um, I, one of the key reasons that we have such a backlog in our system to access um, family violence refuge because it's impossible nearly to exit anyone out into long term housing. And so that just pushes the demand back and back to the point where we have um, women and children in motels where they never should be and they're there for far longer than they ever should be. Um, so, I mean, that's the big kind of elephant systemic one in the room. I think on a smaller level in terms of housing that gap that you mentioned in terms of not being able to access um, long-term social housing until you've had the baby is just um, crazy to me particularly when you're considering with family violence when when the woman is pregnant it is such a window of opportunity for her to um, seek support and a window of incredibly increased family violence risk during pregnancy and immediately post birth so the fact that we're not creating a system that can join those risk factors and needs and windows to work with the the um, family together is ridiculous and it's a similar situation I understand if you've had a child removed and trying to seek reunification that um, it's very difficult to get placed into family suitable 
long-term accommodation prior to getting your kids back, but you can't get your kids back until you have a suitable place for them to live. So that's a huge systemic gap. Um, I think from our perspective, um, you know, the perpetrator continues to remain more invisible than they should. And thinking about, um, I think, where in each um, woman and child's sort of life that family violence is or has been and how it might still be impacting her life and the need to kind of keep a view of is the source of family violence from um, childhood and perhaps more historic and what but what sort of impact is that disconnection from their family and that trauma having on um, clients now is it an intimate partner family violence that may be still very active in, and we know that um, family violence risk escalate escalates again once someone thinks about leaving or tries to leave, which as people have said is often required of you by the system to maintain custody of your children. So we're creating these situations where people are being asked to step in to increase family violence risk, but not being given any of the support they need to help mitigate that risk and then basically hanging them out to dry because they haven't been able to meet these ridiculous expectations of them. Um, so those are I mean, I could probably go on and on, on, but I'd say those are the two biggest okay. policy gaps from my perspective. I don't know if anyone else would like to. Yeah. Thank you, Kate. Yeah, very, very um, pertinent ones. And I guess one that we're certainly um, facing also with the Cornelia program, and we haven't, we're looking at creative ways around it, is we talk about pregnant women not being able to access long term housing timely enough for the birth of the child or to reunify. But then we also have women, and Teresa, you mentioned that young woman that you found you know, near death, who was a, um, yeah, an, probably an illegal um, uh, resident. And unfortunately, even to access long-term housing, you must be a permanent resident. So we have vulnerable women who then are also not even eligible for the very small level of service that exists. And you know, we certainly have women presenting for the Cornelia program who are non-residents and therefore not even eligible to access the accommodation. And so we are looking at ways in which we can bridge that significant policy gap because these are vulnerable women in a more vulnerable state, not eligible for income, no family here because, and they're also not eligible to, for state services. It's just, um, it's a gap that's been around for way too long and we don't have the perfect solution yet, but we are looking at ways that we might be able to pick that up. But that is certainly a, a gap for government to consider how to manage. Um, just building on what both of you have said as well, the other thing is while there's um, the need for housing first, and it's also about the right type of housing and making sure that it's designed in a way that is safe and secure, that it um, respects women where they're at, that there are services provided on site so that people don't have those issues of trying to get to their appointments or work out how they're going to get to their services or how they, once their baby's born, how they're going to get their baby to their services because that's an incredibly difficult task to undertake. And some of the feedback we've had from both Cornel the Cornelia program and our early residents in Viv's place is how the safety that they feel by being in a really secure place where they know that they can relax and get to know their baby or reconnect um, with their children and actually think about what's next is a really, really important part of the process. And I think that is one of the service gaps. You know, we've got some pilot programs going, but how we expand upon those so that they're not unique will be really important and how we can transition people so that they can go um, we've had a great outcome that we didn't expect. We've had two women that have moved directly from their home or from the perpetrator's home into Viv's place, which is long-term housing. And that's like an unheard of thing that we haven't really, um, most, of, um, most of our staff have said it's something that never happens. You know, you don't get to see that very often. And it allows them to automatically, the children can engage with school. We can have maternal and child health services in place. And it's that connected system that's really important, but that it's also designed in a way that allows people to feel safe and secure to start rebuilding their lives. And I think that's that's the other part of the conversation, especially for women leaving family violence, that's a little bit different um, and possibly more complex than the broader social and affordable housing conversations. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
we'll do it four beds yes yeah. yeah so that i um all right we're thinking the same thing which is so from the drug and alcohol perspective um one of the big policy areas or oh, there's two policy areas that i'm really interested in so one is um how hard it is to take a young or anyone from mildura and how far they have to travel um we also take a lot of people from regional areas and it is the most difficult exit to exit someone at a particular hour with a, a brand new baby or heavily pregnant it's really messy and very complicated so i have a real interest in the future design and we were, we were so lucky that our building was designed to think what would make a woman actually stay and if, and as we designed it i just said i don't want a mum to pack up and go home because actually home is easier so in the end they built everything that you know doors that lock so that you have this feeling that your you and your baby are safe and your door is lockable and you're not going to be the victim of yet another violent assault and so into that i think that we should be looking at more regional services because the second part of that is how many grandparents end up if the young um, mum while we're waiting for housing to resolve is able to go to a family member um sometimes that person might need to live a little bit closer and saying that so this is the other policy area i've been really upset a couple of times when maybe grandma just herself had spent some time in Dame Phyllis 10 years ago. And so when child protection look at who might be um, an appropriate family member, grandma or auntie are excluded because of their own forensic history. And yet they offer the opportunity for support and for the woman and the infant to remain together. And I'm really clear that if we're trying to keep the mother and the infant together, we might need to look at um, so of course I talk with some women about the spent convictions scheme, but often it's happening at the wrong time, like that's going to take months and we need the mother to be housed imminently. Um, and so of course then the third policy area I would love is because sometimes the young woman is not in the position to make a decision to leave the relationship, but it happens at the moment of birth, I feel such empathy for the child protection system and the distress that everyone goes into when it is housing that is the imminent risk because the mother has demonstrated she is an appropriate mother, she's a beautiful mother, she is connected to her child, she's caring. And where do you send uh, people? So, that's probably the third area I would like to look at is how we could almost access priority housing. <laughs> Even though maybe it's all, it's happening right there and it would have been lovely if it could have been started six months earlier. So. Thanks Rose. Um, I, in, in following on from that, um, community-based drug and alcohol services often see a lot of women that disclose their pregnancy but the model of care that's based in drug and alcohol is very office based. There are some outreach roles. So roles that actually can work at that earlier intervention end and support the mother who's pregnant to actually engage with um, health services and connect in. Um, there, there's a, an absence of those across Victoria. So when we have a fantastic facility, um, that we can actually support mothers to access it's there's not the the models of care within the community to be able to do that so i think if we you know we know the first thousand days research we know all the research the earlier we can support and stabilize the better outcomes for mother and baby so i think that is a significant gap and also I, i'm very passionate about working across sectors and i think um there is a lack of investment in supporting that work so it's very hard work and it's resource it takes resource so you know that cross-sectoral work to be able to strengthen that wraparound support for mother and baby mother while she's pregnant um, i think that needs to be a real focus of government so, so you just 
Um, just from um, a perspective. Um, I, I think we'll have one more All right. Comment. Okay, all right. I'll do a quick. Yep, okay. Um, yeah. what, what, what else well, I'll include that in what I think yeah. is important. <laughs> um, look, I think it's really important, particularly with a focus on young women, like teenage young mothers, 16 to 20, that we try and ensure that whatever our service response is normal and is is linking them in and provides them the, the best um, connections we can make, like pathways, that they have the, the normal maternal and child health experience, that they go to the toy library, the toy library exists anymore, and they go to local story time, and that we facilitate that to happen, and that also, if possible, when we talk about ongoing housing, that it's in their community. Because what I think is important is the community connection and the relationships they build in their community will support them ongoing, whether it's they're up within their own families, but also their friendship groups and their connection. And that we don't, there are many young women that find themselves in these circumstances that don't have that have, don't have significant problems. Their problems are structural in terms of they haven't got access to um, proper, affordable, long-term housing in their community and they haven't got proper income support. So that's, that's yeah. what I think is important to keep in mind as well. So I'm just going to get... I think we can finish on an optimistic note. I think that is there has been a lot of progress and I've got a we're not we're gonna run out of time. So I just thought if, if everyone could just have one statement around um what they think are some of the current successes or something that they'd like to see more of in terms of work that we that can be done to improve things. I think there's some, there are some really strong positives at the moment. There's a lot of federal and state interest in um, thinking about funding, thinking about strategies, what programs work. But I think the other aspect is we do know what works and we're really clear we've got good pilot programs across all different services, um, partnerships across housing organisations, service delivery groups, hospitals, like we know what's wor what works. And I think what we're up to now is let's build on that and actually invest in the things that are helping women who are pregnant or people who are pregnant and people with young children and infants to actually just stabilise and have that sense of a secure and safe home going forward. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think the other positives, I mean, there's a huge amount of reform in the family violence sector that I think is great in terms of bringing that multidisciplinary practice together and to I, I agree that's that's where the great work is done, but it's incredibly time consuming and hard and needs to be resourced well. But I think we do know that it works and have um, pilots and platforms from which we can build and expand. Um, so, yeah, I'd say that's, that's the positive. So the positives um, that I see uh, and I hear this uh, strongly in Vicky's story and what we've seen at Horizon and Cornelia and what our program does is where we see the just how strong women are and the human spirit and what we, you keep judging that these young women will not cope and you see magic within them. So, and I feel that around it, I watch a whole lot of our staff take on the role that we take for granted which is when you have support from other women and your mum and aunties and stuff, we are doing this for people that they don't actually have that. And I watch the magic of some of these women. Look at me, I'm going to get so upset. I have just seen some young women reach into the depths of courage. And that's why I'm such a huge fan and a believer of what this pregnancy and birth does. And I am. Oh, I cry all the time at work <laughs> because we do see inspiration, but I do have to give staff this absolute pat on the back to say you're actually the arms of, you know, the missing grandma and mother. It's 
supposed to boil my... Anyway, that's what I would just like to say to all of the people working in this sector. I think you underestimate the role that you play in the arms around the young lady. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I would completely agree. And I think that the passion and dedication and the wisdom and the learning that is across different sectors is um, really prominent. And I think in this space, it's very much at the forefront. Um, I also think in um, hearing Vicky, uh, you speak and centering all of our um, activity and advocacy and um, you know, the formation of new services and putting our, our young girls and women that have actually experienced the system at the centre of that. There is a lot of really positive movement going on across, you know, on government level, but it's a bottom-up approach and we need to, I guess, hold on to the champions that can work at that top level as well, but always, you know, positioning women with and young women that have experienced the journey right at the centre and enabling them to be the voice. That's that's some really powerful stuff. Concur with everything that's been said. And I think so the only thing I'd probably like to add is that with, through the Cornelia program and the and the arms that are around them and the supports that are in place, they, they've secured their life, well, they're getting their life on track as a mother, as a, a woman. But what We've been doing some programs, and I point to Emma, who's here at the moment, our community development coordinator, but running, empowering these women to actually do things in life that maybe they didn't even have capacity to think about. You talk about being an awesome cook right now, and and we've got these women who are giving back to their community that are actually running activity. And we've had a woman who was 32 weeks pregnant cooking for 40 people and loving herself, silly doing it, and realise that there's this skill that she had and just the opportunity was not there and it's about just giving the, the minute you put some safety and stability around that the most amazing um, opportunities present that we take for granted and it's been awesome seeing some of these women just blossom into what they can be only purely because the opportunity has been given to them that they should have had all along and so I want to see more of that and it's about those stories they're the stories that are going to get government to sit up and listen. We heard Minister say today that she'd like to be up in the next announcement saying it's recurrent and we will hold her to that and try and remind her. But it's the stories that will actually, that's, it's the changing lives that, that is the real story here. I think everyone has already said taking all the pain. <laughs> but I think it's listening to what um, women are saying and they're saying they need the most important takeaway message for me and also that we have mechanisms to document that and I think research is a key to promoting evidence-based practice as well. Everyone on this panel has written something in parity yeah. terms. They're all um, very worthwhile articles to read. And the passion and um, insight, yeah, I'd like to thank you. Contribution. Well, I, I um, we all like to be right. And um, on this occasion, I think I was right when I said that the panel would be fabulous. Um, so uh, thanks to Sally, Laura, Kate, Rose, Lisa, Giovanna and Suzanne. Give them another round. And I think as Laura summed up for us all, um, they do know what works and what we need to do to build on what's currently in place. So uh, I think that's the challenge that is before us all. Um, in support. Um, so uh, it remains, I did spy something that looked awfully like afternoon tea um, on my way in. So I'm hoping that, yes, so, so we, we're close to afternoon tea. Um, <clears throat> but if I could again thank our hosts uh, here at Uniting, Vic Taz, um, if I could um, again thank the members of the Pregnancy and Homelessness Network uh, for their stellar predominantly voluntary um, cross-sector work 
uh, and especially its convener, um, Dr. Therese, Therese Lynch. Um, again, the sponsors, Launch Housing for underpinning this edition, um, and also the other sponsors, Safe and Equal, Royal Women's Hospital, Housing First, and Task Force, who are represented here today, uh, but uh, also um, have written in this edition. Thanks to all our speakers. Uh, thanks to all of the contributors to this edition. And again, to Noel Murray, our parody editor, which everybody uh, has, who everybody has acknowledged has been um, crucial in pulling together this very fine edition of parody. Um, to again remind you that it's Homelessness Week next week and Homelessness Australia um, has a, an event at lunchtime on Monday, um, which I think many of you would find interesting. Um, so think about registering for that and also Monday week, um, the National Conference, um, where Noel will be there with his table with lots of parodies um, to give away if you haven't seen them already. And Teresa wants to... Well, you can see that. <laughs> it's a party. It's a party you wouldn't want missed. So what Therese is saying outside of the microphone for those online is that if you want to be part of the network, the invitation is there and it's really just a matter of contacting anyone who's on the network to um, uh, find out how to be part of it, which is a great note for saying thanks to all and um, thanks to those people online. And I hope your refrigerator's got something in it because we're going off to afternoon. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, just to uh, but it's not until seven thirty, so I think it's not so